Good morning, everyone. Here I am again, Ethel Ragland, here to lead you in worship. It's a lovely day this Thursday when we're filming, and we don't yet know who's going to be President of the United States for the next four years. But whatever, we will pray that it is in God's hands. So let us worship the Lord our God. We can begin by singing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now join me as we repeat the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have a few, just a few, on our prayer list today. Let us remember Frank Kakesi. Leota Schramm and Phil Sheedon. So we'll keep those in mind as we go to the Lord in prayer. I'll give you a moment of silence and then we'll pray together for ourselves, our friends and neighbors, our families and the world. So let us pray. O oh, holy, almighty God, you are a great God. You are a good God, loving and kind, way more than we deserve. Help us, Lord, to confess our sins to you daily. Help us, Lord, to walk with you daily. Help us to call on you when we need you. Help us to praise your name. Lord, we thank you for all that you give us life and breath, a place to live, friends, people to take care of us. And we ask you to bless each and every one of them. And we give praise and thanks for our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, our Messiah, our Savior, who lived and died and rose for us that we might have eternal life, life full and abundant now and on into eternity. And until we get there with you, we have your Holy Spirit with us. For your Spirit is in each individual believer. Thank you, God, for your presence of the Holy Spirit. May your Spirit open our hearts and move us now as we worship you. We worship you in spirit and in truth. We listen for your word. We listen for you to speak to our hearts that we may be loving and kind and forgiving as you are. O oh Lord, we ask you to bless each and every person bringing good news throughout the world. Especially bless those missionaries that go throughout the world, some living in dangerous places, all doing it to give good news to people who so sorely need it. Bless all those who are in places of danger, those in our military and our police officers and others who do what is right, hopefully in your name. We ask you to bless the leaders of this country and whoever it will be decided that will serve next. Help them to serve us and to serve you as a leader doing what is right. Oh Lord, we thank you for this day, this time of worship. We thank you for doctors and nurses and caregivers who take care of us, people who help us live good lives, we give you thanks, and we lift up in prayer those who have need of your healing hand. We remember Frank Kakesi, Leota Schramm, and Phil Sheedon. 
We remember our families. We remember friends, those maybe on our halls who need your help and your love. Lord, we thank you for all that we have and all that we are, for you are our blessing. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Next, we have our psalm for today. Psalm number 78, uh, the first seven verses. This is a very long psalm. Ralph Nessick says it is a historical litany, and so it tells of Israel's history in 72 verses. So we only have seven today. It explains the ups and downs of God's people according to their faithfulness to God. And its purpose, Ralph says, is to urge people to obey God and teach their children about God. And I think that's an important thing for us to do. So read with me, read responsively. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their children. We will tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a decree in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and rise up and tell them to tell their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God but keep his commandments. And now, join me as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, teaching us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our first hymn is, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. The author of this hymn, William Williams, had been preparing for a career in medicine, but one Sunday morning he heard a man preaching in a Welsh churchyard. He responded in faith, and his life was drastically changed. For 43 years he preached and sang throughout Wales and became known as the Poet Laureate of the Welsh Revival. Soon all Wales was singing their way to the coal mines and the soccer matches and this became their favorite marching song. In the hymn, Williams compares the Christian life to the Israelites' trek through the wilderness. He refers to God feeding the children of Israel with manna, leading them with a fire and a cloudy pillar, and finally guiding them across the Jordan River into Canaan. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak though you are mighty, hold me with your powerful hand. Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Open now the crystal fountain where the healing waters flow. Let the fire and cloudy pillar lead me all my journey through. Strong deliverer, strong deliverer, ever be my strength and shield. When I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. Death of death, and hell's destruction, land me safe on Canaan's side. Songs of praises, songs of praises, I will ever sing to you. So that is a, a good song for us because sometimes we feel we are living in a barren land these days. We turn to our story. It's from Matthew, back to Matthew, the 25th chapter, the first 13 verses. And this is a parable. And it may have some things in it that don't seem what would be normal for today, and it isn't. This was back in the days of Jesus, and Jesus tells us this parable. 
then the kingdom of heaven may be compared to ten maidens who take their oil and go out to meet the bridegroom. Now, five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. For the foolish did not take oil with them for their lamps, but the wise took little flasks of oil for their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they grew weary and slept. But at midnight, a call came, Behold the bridegroom, come out and greet him. And all those maidens got up and they trimmed their lamps. And the foolish one said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise said, No, there will not be enough for both you and us. Go out to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And they went out. And afterward, the bridegroom came, and all those who were prepared went into the feast, the marriage feast with him, and the door was shut. Now the other maids came, and they said, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he said, Truly I tell you, I never knew you. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the day or the hour. So this is a story that we could call uh, by the Boy Scouts motto, Be Prepared. The scenes here were common occurrences in those days. A wedding was a great occasion. The whole village turned out. They were accompanied the new couple to their new home and they took the longest route to get to the home in order to receive the good wishes from everyone along the way. There were no trips to the tropics for the honeymoon those days. The couple stayed home. It was a week of open house. The newlyweds were treated as a prince and princess. And all this was missed by the foolish maidens. Now in some versions it says virgins, and in some versions it says bridesmaids. And they missed it because they were not ready. They were not prepared. It was common for the bridegroom to be delayed. So they all had to be ready for his arrival. And no one was allowed in those days to be in the streets after dark without a lighted lamp. When the bridegroom arrived, the door was shut and no one who was late would be admitted. So what is the meaning behind this story? It was directed against the Jews, Barclay said. They had a whole rich history which proclaimed the coming of the Son of God, the Messiah, and they should have been ready. They'd been told this over and over. They told it to their children who told it to their children and on down. The rabbis always told the history to the people, but they were unprepared, and so they were shut out. And Barclay gives us two universal warnings from this story. The first is that some things cannot be obtained at the last minute. You don't wait until the night before the exam to study, although some of us probably did. We don't wait to prepare ourselves to meet God. That we should not do. And two, certain things cannot be borrowed. You cannot borrow a relationship with God. Maybe your parents were great Christians, but you can't be a Christian for that reason. You cannot borrow a character. These are things that need to be prepared before it is too late. In Will Willimon's study, he's the Duke Divinity School professor, he said, I think it is very timely. He says that times of crisis will happen, and look where we are. So we shouldn't be surprised. We should expect the unexpected. We should prepare for difficulty and testing. Jesus promises to give us what we need. He will be with us through the hard times, the tragedies, the miseries. And Willeman shows that this parable only is in Matthew. Jesus is coming. 
And at this time of year, we anticipate Advent. We celebrate the time when Jesus came as a baby who came to earth, the Son of God coming as a man. Jesus is coming, but are we ready? Not necessarily ready for Christmas, but are we ready for Jesus to come, to be with us? Are we ready to submit to the authority of God, submit to God's love for us? All the bridesmaids were friends of the bride and groom, so they all wanted to be in on the wedding party, but not all were ready. Some did not think ahead. We call Jesus Lord as the the girls did, Lord, Lord, open the doors. Jesus is our friend. Are we ready for Jesus to be our friend? And what do we need to do while we wait? Willimon asked, what's with these selfish bridesmaids that they would not share their oil with the others? They all wanted to go to the party. It might be a week-long event. Meet the bridegroom at his parents' house and escort him to the bride's home and begin the feast. So five carefully prepared. They brought oil along, extra. Five did not. Five planned for a delay. Five did not. So the foolish had to leave in the middle of the night and find oil for their lamps. It was too late when they got back. The door was shut. The bridegroom said, sorry, you should have been prepared. And Jesus ends saying, watch, for you know neither the day nor the hour. We don't know when our hour will come. We don't know when Jesus will return. Willimon loves to tell stories and he's very good at it. This is one, there was a young couple with a new baby who visited the church and Willimon visited them and other members of the church visited and they came a few times, but then they quit and were not seen again. But there was a tragedy, a car crash and the young husband was killed, and the woman was left with a young baby, and she was distraught, asking, Is God punishing me? How do you explain this? Many people ask questions like that when they are in the middle of a tragedy, a situation that really can't be explained. And what can we say? Do we tell them that your lamp was empty because you didn't have any extra oil? Willimon received a call from Mary, a member of the church. She believed her husband had just died. The ambulance was on the way, and he went, and the, he and the ambulance got there about the same time. And the woman, Mary, asked at the door, Tell me what you said in your sermon last week about eternal life. I want to be sure I got it right. Listening to his sermon, Mary was obtaining oil for her lamp getting ready for the night, her lamp would be lit. Unlike oil, faith cannot be given to another. You can tell another about your own faith, your own experiences with Jesus, but you cannot give anyone else faith. They have to receive Christ. They have to believe, and they have to get ready. Thomas Aquinas was asked by a student, is God limited in any way? He replied, no, God is omnipotent, all-knowing. God shares none of our human limitations. But Aquinas thought and said, no, that's not quite right. God does share one limitation with us. Even God Almighty cannot make the past not to have been. Well, maybe God could, but God doesn't. God can forgive the past sins, and God does not erase those sins. God does not erase our past. We are to learn from our sins, ask for forgiveness, and move on. John Wesley bragged, our people die well, because he saw his Methodism as a lifetime preparation for the end of life. Church is where we come to get ready to die. That's an interesting statement Willimon makes. A person in the church explained that he could not keep up his financial commitments that he had made to the church. 
There were unforeseen expenses, and he was in a financial bind. He had a 15-year-old refrigerator that died. His car, nearly 200,000 miles on it, needed extensive repairs. His nearly 20-year-old air conditioning system was broken. Were these unforeseen expenses, or was he not being aware? Was he not being prepared? Are you ready to meet your God? Be awake. You don't know the day or the hour. So daily walk with God. Daily talk with God. Daily listen to God. Be prepared. There is a new life waiting for you. It begins right now when we accept the love of God, accept Christ as our Savior, and we start an abundant life and it will extend on into eternity. This is Williman's prayer for today. We boldly pray that you would work in our lives to prepare us for your presence among us, Lord Jesus. Stir up a desire to welcome you in all times. We worship today to praise you, to grow into your grace, to hear your claims upon our lives in service to you and your kingdom. Amen. And I chose for our last hymn, a familiar old hymn, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. So let's see what we have about that one. This is by Fanny Crosby, a well-known writer. Fanny Crosby wrote more than 8,000 hymns and used more than 200 pen names. Under contract to a music publisher, she wrote three new hymns each week during much of her adult life. The fact that she was blind didn't diminish her productivity. She would formulate an entire song in her mind and then dictate it to a friend or a secretary. One of her good friends was Phoebe Palmer Knapp, wife of the founder of the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. One time when Knapp came to Brooklyn to see Crosby, she brought a tune with her that she had composed. Play it for me on the organ, Crosby requested. Knapp did, and then asked, What does this tune say? She turned to see Crosby kneeling in prayer. Knapp played it a second time, and then a third. Finally, the blind woman responded, That says, Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And so that is what Fanny Crosby wrote. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. The second verse, perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. So this should be our story, that we have the blessed assurance that Jesus is ours, and we will be at rest, happy and blessed, waiting and watching, and being prepared to receive Jesus into our hearts, to love him more than anything because he died for us. So now, may the Lord of love and mercy, the Lord of endless delight, be with you throughout your whole week. Go with God, for God is always with you, a breath away. Amen.